Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, my, it's good to see everybody in today, and uh, well, we've even had to set up some bleacher seats back there, and uh, we're sorry about that. We're going to see about more tables, Gary, or something. But anyhow, we've got folks from, I uh, hope I can remember, Indiana and uh, Michigan and New York, was that right? And uh, then a lot of new folks from right around here in Oklahoma, but my, we're glad to see everybody, and we just trust that, that the Lord will bless us with a great afternoon in the Word. And again, for those of you joining us on television, in case this is the first time you're catching us, if you're like everybody else, I was just going through, clicking, and I saw the blackboard, and uh, they stopped. Well, if you're one of those today watching the program, we're just an informal Bible study. Uh, I never attack anybody, hopefully. All I want to do is just show folk what the book says, and then you do with it what you will. Then it's no longer my responsibility, it's yours. And uh, we just know that the Lord has been blessing that approach because we are getting such a response. I could stand here for 24 hours, couldn't I, honey, just telling you of pastors and Bible teachers that are calling to tell me, how did I miss this for 40 years? It's just amazing. But uh, I'll just briefly give you one. He had two PhDs in theology, had pastored for 40 years, retired, and somebody gave him a satellite. First day he had the satellite, he caught my program, got hooked, and then after 12 months of studying and seeing all this, he called and he said, I had to tell you, how did I miss all this through all that education and 40 years of preaching? He's, I'd never heard it before. And uh, that's just one. I could stand here, like I said, for 24 hours. But anyway, we just want to open the Word and uh, just let people study it and see it on their own. Okay, Iris is my, my promoter, you know, and she said, now let people know that we have this eight-hour video of our last cruise on the Aegean Sea. And, of course, the theme of all my lectures on board ship was, Why Paul? And, of course, I started out with, the Lord had 12 apostles. Why did he need another one? And so we titled that series, Why Paul? So that's available on an eight-hour tape. And uh, then she wants me to keep reminding you that this one and only book we've published has just been received so fantastically. Invariably, if somebody gets a copy, they call right back and they order 10 more, 15, 20, just amazing. And uh, they get a copy into the hands of all their friends and relatives. So it's, uh, it's really a pretty good little book. 88 questions, and the answers are taken from the program material. Okay, I think that's enough for announcements. We're in book number 72. We're in the last four programs. And this whole series of this book I've been using to prove at least from my mindset, why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, hopefully now in these next four programs, I'll be able to open a lot of minds with the Lord's direction and uh, get a lot of people who previously were doubtful and get you convinced that, yes, we can stand on a pre-tribulation outcalling that we will not go into the tribulation. So that's the whole theme of these 12 programs. All right, still on that basis then, moving into the last four, we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 3 again. And I admit, a lot of this is repetition. I uh, just saw a little bit of the program before we left this morning, and that was way back in book number 6, and I was on almost the same things that I'm going to be touching on today. But my, that's 15 years ago, isn't it, Luther? And uh, so a lot of people have missed all that, so uh, we don't apologize for repeating some of these things. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, and let's just start reading at verse 1. For this cause, in other words, because of what he has written in those first two chapters, we're saved by faith plus nothing. So for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you, word, that is to Gentiles, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, 
whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages or past generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, in other words, Paul's co-workers, that the Gentiles, see now I'm hitting that word extra hard for a purpose, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world, in other words, going all the way back to Adam, has been hid in God, the same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, now our key verse, of course, goes up to verse 2. And this is where we stress that the body of Christ is something that was never revealed anywhere in your Bible. You cannot find a reference to it. You cannot find even a hint of it in any portion of Scripture except from Romans 1.1 to the last verse of Philemon. Even Hebrews, which is written by, I think, the Apostle Paul, but it was directed to the Jewish people and not to the Gentiles like the rest of his letters are. All right, now within this scope of Romans through Philemon then, we have over and over, and we didn't get tired time before to get them on, but Sharon's going to get it on at the next break, the references in Paul's epistles to this word mystery. And it's used in other portions of Scripture, but not in the same context. When Paul uses the word mystery, he's referring to biblical doctrinal things that have been kept secret that no one else ever had any idea of until it was revealed to him. Now, I'll make a statement, and it may upset some people, but I can't help it. It's the truth of the matter. The only reason they cannot agree 100% with my take on all these Gentile doctrines coming from Paul is because they refuse to admit that this is the case that none of these things were ever revealed anywhere else in your Bible. You cannot find them in the four Gospels. You can't find it in the Old Testament. You can't find it in the first eight chapters of Acts. You can't find it in the Jewish epistle. It's not in there. And so we have to immediately open our eyes and realize that the things I'm talking about were definitively, separately given to this one apostle. Now, when I introduced the, the tape a little bit ago, I hope you heard what I said. Jesus had how many apostles? Twelve. Well, why did he need another one? For the simple reason that the twelve were sent to Israel. They were the apostles of the nation of Israel. Under the law, the temple is operating. This man is sent the other direction, contrary to even the Lord's own directions in Matthew chapter 10, where he told the twelve, go not into the way of a Gentile, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he comes to this man and he says, you're going to the Gentiles. Now that's what you have to understand. And when you see that, the whole thing just lays out as clear as noonday sun. But they don't want to see that. They want to keep hanging on Christ's earthly ministry. They want to keep hanging on Peter, James, and John. And as long as you do that, you're never going to see it. Because that's the blinder. That's the blinder. All right, now I'm going to take you to one more verse of Scripture that we use quite a bit. Uh, I guess you can leave Ephesians for the time being. Come back with me to 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 15. It's a verse that's on all my little books, and uh, we refer to it over and over, but I haven't a lot of times on the program. 
2 Timothy 2.15. And again, it's a key verse if you're going to really get a handle on Scripture. Most of you know that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study. See, that's what I emphasized in my opening remarks. I want to get people into the book. They don't have to listen to what I say. Get into the book. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or separating the word of truth. Now that says it all. And it doesn't mean clarify between Matthew and Malachi. What you divide are the Jewish scriptures from what Paul has given to the Gentile. And when you separate those two, there it lays. Just as plain as plain can be. But again, most of Christendom refuses to do that. They just have to use the Gospels. They have to use the words of the Lord Jesus himself, not realizing that every word that comes from the pen of this other apostle is also from the ascended Lord. My, in the book of Acts, Paul was addressing Jude and what he said, and the Lord spoke to me, and he told me, get thee far hence from Jerusalem. They will not hear you concerning me. I'm going to send you far hence to the Gentiles. Well, you have to understand then that every word that Paul writes by inspiration is from the ascended Lord after the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, you've got to let that soak in. Everything else he spoke was before the cross. The temple is still operating. Israel is still under the law. Acts, just for example, just for an example, I take these things as they come to mind. Back up now to Acts chapter 3. And I know people read this and they don't even see it. It doesn't register. And that's why I have to, like Paul says, I have to raise my voice. Otherwise, people don't pay any mind. But all right, Acts chapter 3, just as an example. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now, this is shortly after Pentecost. Now, Peter and John went up together into the, what? Temple. See that? Peter and John go up to the temple at the hour of prayer according to what? Judaism. See, that was part of Judaism, that they had their hours of prayer just like the Muslims do today. Why do the Muslims drop on their knees five times a day? It's because their religion demands it. All right, Judaism wasn't any different. It was a legalistic religion. All right, and so these men are still under it. And so they went into the temple at the hour of prayer, it being the ninth hour. Well, that's just one glaring example of how the twelve, you see, were still under the law. They were still under temple worship. But this other apostle is now completely separated from all that and given this whole new dispensation of grace, which involves what he refers to over and over as the mysteries. And hopefully we'll have them on the board by the time we start our next half hour. But over and over he's going to refer to a different mystery. If I'm not mistaken, there were 13 or 14 of them. All right, now another verse I want to refer to before we uh, go back into my theme for this half hour, which is the plan of salvation for the body of Christ. I want you to look for a moment at Romans Chapter 16, verse 25, a verse that I use over and over, but nobody else does. You never see this verse used in a Sunday morning sermon. You'll never see this verse used in a Sunday school quarterly. They, they avoid it like a plague, like a plague. But look what it says. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him... That is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the what? A mystery. And what's the word mystery? A secret. 
All right. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret, totally unknown. The twelve knew nothing of this gospel. It was kept secret since the world or the ages began. All right, let's just move on over one more, and then we're going to go back and look at some definitive salvation verses. Come back with me to Colossians. That goes forward through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. And now drop in at verse 24. And all this is written by the Apostle Paul primarily to the Gentile world. And now to Gentile believers. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, "...who now rejoice in my sufferings for you." In other words, he suffered for 25, 6 years of ministry for the sake of the gospel. "...and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ, the beatings, the imprisonments, the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church." the church which is his body, whereof or because of I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. Almost identical with what we started out with in Ephesians 3. All right, to fulfill or to bring to completion the word of God. Even the mystery, there's that word again, see? Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations, but now on this side of the cross, through this apostle, this is now made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this particular mystery, this singular one. It'll be on the board in the next half hour. And this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You won't find language like that anywhere else. Jesus never said something like that. Peter never said anything like that. The Old Testament prophets never said anything like that. Why? Because this is a whole new program for the human race. And this is what we're going to show before we get hopefully to the end of the afternoon. All right, on your way back, I'm going to start all the way back in Romans, but on the way, stop at 1 Corinthians 15. Now I know a lot of you say, oh, less again. Yep, again. <laughs> because... We've all used John 3.16 that way, haven't we? Man, we've used John 3.16 until you almost thought it was the only verse in Scripture. Now, that's what we got to do with 1 Corinthians 15 instead. Because like I've been shocking people over the years, John 3.16 doesn't mean a thing unless you bring Paul's gospel into it. Then, of course, that's why Christ came. But you leave John 3.16 as it sets in the chapter. Hey, there's nothing of the death, burial, and resurrection in there. Not a word. Not even a thought. But now I'll show you when you take 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 and put it alongside or shove it into John 3.16. Yeah, it, it's a workable thing. All right, but 1 Corinthians 15, especially for those out in television who probably haven't been with us that long before. Starting at verse 1. This is what Paul calls my gospel. This is the gospel of the grace of God. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Now remember, who is he writing to? Corinthians, Gentiles, who had come out of abject, wicked paganism. But now they're believers, see? All right? And so wherein you stand. Now verse 2. By which, it's by this gospel, you are saved. And that's the whole theme of Scripture, of course. Even Adam and Eve had to be saved. Israel had to have a saving faith. 
Christ had to certainly preach a saving message. All right, for us today, this is it. By which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, lest you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it comes now. This is the heart of the salvation message for us today. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's our gospel. And you can't just take part of it. You have to have all of it, or God won't accept it. All right, now then, let's just do this for the fun of it. Go all the way back to John 3.16. Everybody has been steeped in it since, you might say, the day that the Lord said it. But when the Apostle Paul came along after the work of the cross, then John 3.16 became rather inadequate. It does not say it all. And that's what we have to understand. All right, you got John's Gospel, chapter 3. Look at verse 16. For God so loved the world. No doubt about that, is there? It was love that sent him. Love is the epitome of our Christian faith, isn't it? You know, I made the, the statement in one of my seminars in Florida. That's where we are totally opposite of Islam. Islam says if he's not a believer, kill him. We say if he's not a believer, show him the love of God. We don't want him to go to a devil's hell just because he's a Muslim. Quite the opposite. All right, but that's the whole idea. Our faith is based on the love of God, which drove him, of course, to the cross. Absolutely it did. But the cross isn't mentioned in this verse. We have to interpolate if you're going to do it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, since we know the work of the cross, since we know it's based on death, burial, and revenue, we just take for granted that that's what everybody knows. But that isn't what John 3.16 says. John 3.16 says that if you believe in Jesus as the only begotten of Son, then you will not perish but have everlasting life. Well, in Christ's earthly ministry, that was the message. That if they would believe who Jesus was, that He was the Son of God, and that He was the anointed coming King of the kingdom, they had salvation without any mention of the cross. But, beloved, once the work of the cross was finished, then that takes preeminence so far as God is concerned because that's where salvation was accomplished. When Christ died, He died for you, He died for me. When His blood was shed, it paid your sin debt, it paid my sin debt. When He was buried, you and I were buried with Him by identification. When He arose from the dead in power, we arose with Him. And we too are imbued with the power now of the Holy Spirit. But you see, when you John 3.16 by itself, you don't have any of that. And so you've got to bring in some of these Pauline things, or you're still only halfway there. All right, now then, let's come back again quickly. I've got a lot to cover in four minutes. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm just going to show what is the plan of salvation in this dispensation of the grace of God, which Sharon has got that up here. So I'm going to use it. Here we've come now, all the way since the Old Testament, as we've been stressing in the last eight programs especially, everything was Jewish, everything was looking forward to the coming of Israel's Messiah, and he began his three years of earthly ministry going up and down the byways of Israel with the twelve apostles at his side. But Israel, in unbelief, rejected him, crucified him, and after his burial, his resurrection, forty days with the twelve, he ascended back to glory. All right, then according to all the Old Testament prophecies, after having ascended, a short time later, in would come the wrath and vexation of God, which we call the tribulation. The Old Testament is full of it. All the prophets spoke of his rejection and of his ascension, but of his bringing in the wrath and vexation, and then that would end with the second coming, and Jesus would establish his earthly kingdom. That's all the Old Testament writers knew, and that was all under Israel's law. But 
after Pentecost and Israel keeps rejecting it and rejecting it, then God just, you might say, gives up on the nation of Israel, lets them go into their unbelief and their dispersion, permits the Romans to destroy the temple and the city. They're scattered into every nation of the earth. But God does something totally different. He turns to the Gentile with this glorious dispensation of the grace of God. All right, now then, our dispensation of grace has been running some 1900 and some years, ever since the Apostle Paul was converted. You can do it with your own pen at the notepad. I feel that Saul was converted in 37 A.D. So you just subtract 37 from 2007, and how many years has it been? I did it before I left home, and I've already forgotten. How many would it be? But that's how long this gospel of the grace of God has been going out to lost humanity, ever since Saul's conversion, or shortly after. All right, and so now then in Romans 1.16, he's going to make reference as how this gospel, not John 3.16, 1 Corinthians 15, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. For it, Paul's gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes and is baptized. No, it doesn't say that. To everyone who believes and joins the church. doesn't say that. To everyone who believes and speaks in tongues. We're hearing that a lot lately. doesn't say that. To everyone who gives his tithe. It doesn't say that. But see, that's what they're doing to people today. They're adding to this finished work of the cross. But take what the Scripture says. The gospel is the power of God of salvation to everyone that believeth. Well, I guess I'm only going to have time for one more reference. Turn over still in Romans to chapter 3, where it says basically the same thing. Romans chapter 3, dropping in quickly at verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And every human being is a lost sinner until they're saved. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. Then down to verse 26, and we're going to run out of time. To declare, I say, His righteousness, that He might be just and be the just of fire of Him that what? Believes, plus nothing. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.